The most common request I'm getting right now for a video is ExpressRoute. So in this video, let's really take a deep dive look at ExpressRoute. So in this video, I really want to look at all the different aspects around ExpressRoute. Thinking about the basics of the connectivity, thinking about the types of connectivity we can actually leverage, the services we can consume, and then thinking about resiliency, uh, multiple connections. But before we even start thinking about ExpressRoute, let's take a step back. Let's actually think about, well, the Azure network. And we can really think about Azure and Microsoft operate one of the biggest networks in the world. I think at last number, there was something like about 130,000 miles of fiber. They own and operate one of the biggest networks in the world. And they even are dropping new Atlantic cables. There was a partnership with Facebook um, where they dropped the new cable under the Atlantic to provide a new connectivity between the US and Europe. And so you can think about this giant Microsoft backbone. So here I've got this big MS backbone that really kind of scales the world. So it's this global network. And on that global backbone, there are Microsoft services. So absolutely we can think about, well, yet yeah, there are Azure regions. So maybe I have kind of West US, I might have East US. So we have all these various regions. Now those regions, remember, we normally define as kind of that latency envelope. We can think about a certain region is that um, two millisecond round trip latency. So that's how we define a region. It's by that, that round trip latency. So from the worst case scenario, um, that round trip would be two milliseconds. Now those regions connect to that backbone. So you change color. So I think I've got that, that region in Azure. We have these regional network gateways. And those regional network gateways kind of have those redundant connections onto that backbone. So that's repeated across kind of all of the regions. Then if you think about within a region, there are various data centers. Well, those data centers connect those regional gateways. So there's this resiliency on the network. And again, that repeats. So we have these network connections that are connected to that backbone. Now within a region, I have lots of different services. There are things like um, PaaS services. So PaaS service could be storage account, it could be Azure SQL database, it could be cognitive services, all these different things. There are IaaS services. So here, we have kind of virtual networks, we have a VNet, and then virtual machines run inside there, scale sets run inside there. I could have Kubernetes clusters with the worker nodes in there. I can have many PaaS services inject through things like private link. So these interactions with the virtual networks, so I have IaaS services as well. And then there's SaaS services, things like Office 365. And they kind of are powered by lots of different regions. I don't deploy Office 365 to East US. It's a kind of a SaaS service living in that Microsoft cloud, but it's available on there. So we have all of these Microsoft services and they're all attached to that Microsoft backbone, that global network. And then there's us kind of down here. So let's say, for example, this is my facility. Now, in addition to the regions connecting to that backbone, that network also extends to kind of edge nodes. So you can think about all kind of throughout the world, there are these edge nodes. And those edge nodes may have services like Azure Front Door, things like the Content Delivery Network. So some of those things are sitting there. But the point of these edge nodes is, for the most part, they live in sort of carrier independent facilities. Think about like a colo. And the point about these carrier neutral places is that yes, the Microsoft backbone comes into those facilities, but so too do other telcos. 
uh, AT&T, Verizon, Equinix, all of these different people come into these carrier neutral facilities. And that's really what the internet is. The internet is a bunch of different networks connected together. So these edge sites, so on this edge, we connect into all the different carriers. Not all of them, there are some that don't get connected. But there's literally thousands of carriers that we connect into via these carrier neutral facilities. The idea is that as a customer, uh, they probably get service from a certain service provider. In an ideal world, we would only be one kind of hop away from that carrier. We don't want to have to hop through multiple carriers to get to the customer. We want to get as direct a connection as we can. So into these edge locations, we connect into all the various different carriers, again, like AT&T, uh, Verizon, etc. So we have those edge sites, and it's through those that, hey, if I was on my on-premises network, and I just wanted to go and connect to an Azure service via the internet, well, that's how kind of the regions go and connect to the internet, through these various carrier neutral edge sites that connect to all the different carriers. But there are also some of these locations that we call peering points or meet me's. And the goal of these meet me's is this is gonna facilitate private connectivity actually from customer networks. And the way you can think about this is, so again, some of those locations so let's do a slightly bigger one. Once again, we are extending the Microsoft network into that carrier neutral facility. That Microsoft has a whole bank of routers, uh, the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. So you're here, for example, MSEE, that's the Microsoft Edge. And just think about lots and lots of kind of Microsoft routers uh, in that facility. There's secure facilities, and there's cages and cameras and all that stuff. But then there's lots of ports. So at this kind of meet me, so we call this a, a meet me, you can also hear it called a, a peering location. So we have extended the Microsoft network into that facility. We then have lots of partners. Now depending on that peering location, there's gonna be different service providers that offer services there. So what happens is those, those partners will they also have their kind of routers there and they can do connections. So they have a certain number of ports on the MSEE, the Microsoft Enterprise Edge, our routers, and then they can cross connect customers network to our network. So, so what does that look like? So there's really two main models for that connectivity. There's kind of a point to point and an any to any. A point to point would be, hey, I'm, my service provider is essentially gonna drop a line, a fiber cable to my door. Now I draw a single line. We actually have redundant connections. Now, if that single line can support two virtual ethernets over it, then I can just have one physical connection. But then what if that road work outside our building cuts it? So ideally that would be independent um, using separate conduits, so one piece of road work won't cut the wire. But what happens here, so I have my kind of routers at the edge, this is on my network, I connect to here, and then they do that cross connect onto the Microsoft Edge. So that's kind of that point to point. So I'm dropping a line, and I've now essentially connected my network to the Microsoft backbone. I'm not consuming any services yet, I've just connected the network. So at a physical level, there's now a connection between my facility and that Microsoft backbone. The other is any to any. So here I could imagine, well, in, I have maybe multiple data centers and I'm using kind of a, an MPLS so I've got my connections to that MPLS, so it's any to any, so they can talk to each other. So now what happens again is on that MPLS, this kind of, again, has connections, it just becomes a node off of that MPLS, so now the any to any works that route as well. And they can connect to other clouds, that's kind of an MPLS example. 
But whichever model I pick, I'm now connected to that backbone. That, that's kind of that, that key point. I am not connected to a certain region. I am connected to the Microsoft backbone. Now there are different SKUs, types of circuit. Uh, the regular is standard. If I have a standard SKU, express route circuit, I can connect to any region within the geopolitical boundary. So for example, North America. I can connect to any Azure region in North America, if my meet me is North America. If it was in Europe, I can connect to any region in Europe. That's the standard SKU. So you can think about, yes, there is a line that stops me going any further if it's a standard SKU. If it's the premium SKU, then I can go and connect to regions outside of my geopolitical boundary. So when I create my circuit, I'm gonna say, hey, I actually want this to be a premium. It does other things for me as well. Um, I could, if I have permission, do Microsoft 365 over that circuit. Uh, I can broadcast 10,000 routes instead of 4,000 routes. There's other things premium gives me. Uh, I can connect more uh, virtual networks to it. But it, it lets me span that region. So again, I create a circuit. A circuit is really defined by a service key. That service key is the only thing in common between you as a customer, Microsoft, and the carrier. When I create a new express route circuit, it's gonna tell me a service key, and that's what I share with my service provider. Now I say I go and create it in the portal. Microsoft are really moving to a new model where as a customer, I don't wanna deal with that stuff anymore. I don't wanna worry about going to the Azure portal, getting the service key, talking to the service provider, getting them to stand this stuff up. So now there's a lot of APIs behind the scenes. So for the most part, you will just go to your service provider, say, hey, I want this new connection. Through APIs, they go and sort everything else out on the back end through ExpressRoute, through Microsoft. You won't really see anything. It's just gonna happen for you. So that's kind of a nice advancement. So I have standard SKU, any region within my geopolitical boundary, premium SKU, I can access anything. Now these meet me's, the kind of commitment from Microsoft, I think there's about 50 of them today, is for any new region that gets stood up, they're gonna have a meet me close to it. This meet me is not within the region. It's not in that data center. It's not, meet me is not in these data centers. Remember, the meet me is at one of these carrier neutral colos. They want it to be near the region, but it's not in the actual data centers that make up that region. It's close to it. So imagine this was actually South Central region. Well, the closest meet me is San Antonio. So they're always gonna try and have a meet me close to corresponding regions. Now there are other meet me's. If we stay on kind of that Texas example, yes, there's a South Central region, which is actually based in San Antonio. There's a San Antonio meet me. There's also a Dallas meet me location. There's no Azure region hosted in Dallas, but there's a, a critical mass of customers in Dallas that have data centers. So now I could connect to the Dallas meet me, the peering point. Remember the Microsoft Edge is extended into that meet me. So I'm getting on the Microsoft backbone as quick as possible. And then from there, I can go and talk to all of the regions in that geopolitical boundary. If I'm standard premium, I can kind of go anywhere. Let's actually stay on that example just for a second. Um, so let's draw out the Microsoft backbone a little bit more. And this time, let's stay on that kind of um, South Central US. And let's talk about, okay, the Meet Me is in San Antonio. So that's super close, there's redundant connections there. And also there's another Meet Me in Dallas. There's another type of SKU. So we've got standard premium. There's also something called local. Now what local does is I can only talk to the region that is local to the meet me. So in this case, San Antonio is local to South Central. So if I was to stand up a local express route so let's just draw a kind of express route symbol, uh, customer, service provider, and Microsoft symbol. So I've, I'm establishing that express route connection. If this is of type local, 
the boundary of what I can access is that. I cannot talk to East US. I cannot talk to West US. I can only talk to the region that is aligned with that meet me location. So San Antonio, that is aligned with South Central. If I connected to Dallas, well, Dallas is not aligned to any region. So local would not be available there. You may ask, why would I care about this local SKU? Normally on express route, ingress, so data going in, is free. Egress is metered. So I pay for the data coming out of Azure over the express route. Um, the exact amount varies based on um, the continent, the location based on prices of network, but I pay for the egress. There is an unmetered SKU and that costs a lot more. With local, I do not pay for egress. So it's going to be a fixed bill at the end of the month. Ingress and egress are just part of the bill. That's why I can only talk to the region that is aligned with the meet me. And you can actually go and look these up. So there's a website you can go to, and I'll show this, that's actually going to show me the meet me's and the corresponding region. So here you can actually see in this example, it shows things like, well, Amsterdam is lined up with West Europe. But Atlanta, there is no local Azure region. So you can just go down here and look. So if we keep going down the various types of regions available, we can see again Dallas. Well, there is no corresponding region. But if we go and look at San Antonio, well, yeah, then there's South Central. And you can see the partners that actually provide service there as well. So there's a whole bunch of different service providers and you can see which ones operate out of those various meet me locations. So which ones are at that carrier neutral colo? So obviously Dallas, there's a, there's a huge number of partners available there. So go and check that out. It's uh, good to go and look those things up if you're interested in local. There is yet another connectivity option. So I'm drawing these pictures and one of the interesting things you're going to see is obviously there's kind of your edge and you have routers. Now, when you set these up, everything is resilient. When I create an express route circuit, I'm not creating a connection. I get two connections. I get two BGP sessions to exchange routes. I want two connections. So I can think about if I expand this out a little bit. So there's kind of the, the customer edge. I have kind of two routers. Then there's let's say my service provider, well, I connect into routers at the service provider. So I've got those connections kind of going here. And then I've got my Microsoft routers at the Microsoft Edge. And in fact, your service provider probably actually has another set of routers in here to actually connect to those routers. And they kind of do cross connects and all wonderful stuff um, to connect in the middle. So there's the customer routers, the service provider, and the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. That actually gives me the connectivity. That's the regular model, those things. And they're, they're behind the scenes, there's like a 802.1 queue. There's, there's a tag in here. Then the service provider, well, they need to use their own tag for the VLAN. So they do queue in queue. They put a tag in a tag, essentially. That's, that's all that is. So that's kind of Q in Q here. It all gets stripped out. I can't extend a VLAN from my network into Azure. That's a layer two thing. Doesn't work in Azure. But you're trusting this service provider. And also, when you buy Express Route, there are different SKUs. Um, we talked about standard and premium and local. There's also sizes. Um, 50 megabytes all the way up to 10 gigabits per second. Oh, sorry, 50 megabits per second up to 10 gigabits per second. What if I want bigger? So it's actually saying called Express Route Direct. So I talked about there's all these ports in the Microsoft Edge. There's these routers and different service providers get ports that they connect their routers to and then they kind of split those ports over different customers. Um, they, they slice them up. Well, the other option is, hey, look, 
once again, we have kind of those Microsoft routers with all those ports in them. And they're kind of 10 or 100 gigabit per second ports. And then at the bottom we have the customer. Express Route Direct, you don't go through a service provider. You're not connecting to their routers. Express Route Direct, you buy a port. You actually get two ports. Again, I need that resiliency. So Express Route Direct, I am essentially going into this port and I'm going into that port. There is no service provider. Now, the reality is you're not digging that trench and laying that fiber cable. Um, you're still going over a service provider facility. You're just not using their network infrastructure. You're not using their data plane. You're going over their air, in effect. You're going over their location. They're still providing you that cable. But you basically get a lot of authorization from Microsoft that allows that connection to happen. But this is now layer one. This is physical fiber cables. You're worrying about strength of light and terminating fiber cables. This is not for most people. These are for those very large organizations, but they've got multiple business units and they're gonna split this themselves among the different business units. This can go up to 100 gigabits per second. So with Express Route Direct, I'm actually going straight in. Now it is still over that service provider's airspace. And if you maybe had security requirements, and there's actually something cool you can do only with Express Route Direct. Because of Express Route Direct, remember you own the port. That port is dedicated to you. You are buying either a 10 gigabit per second port or a 100 gigabit per second port. I'm getting that physical connection to a port. So what I can actually do is if I, if I choose, I can turn on something called MacSec. So that's layer two. Remember layer two is kind of the MAC address stuff. So I'm turning on MAC security. Here there is encryption at the layer two level between the routers. Um, it's a key I control, it's in my Azure Key Vault. I can roll the key, but obviously when I roll the key, uh, it means they get out of sync temporarily, so there'll be a maintenance window to change the key. But now there's encryption between those two routers. It is not end-to-end. -end. There is no encryption of my network to the router and from this router to Azure. It's purely doing an encryption between that layer two, between the two routers but it means it's encrypted over the airspace of that service provider. So that meet me location, which is still using, that's the MSEE, the edge, I can now have encryption if I wanted to. Now when I do it direct, express route direct, with or without the MACSEC, that's a physical connection. That's not a circuit, that's a port. I then put circuits over my express route direct. So if I have an express route direct of let's say 100 gigabits per second, good for you, I would then lay circuits on top of that. I don't pay for the circuits. I can divide up that 100 gigabit per second based on what? I could create a 100 gigabit per second circuit. I could create a 40 gigabit per second circuit. There are various different SKUs and sizes that I can actually use. And like I say, if I'm not direct, then I just buy a circuit based on the size. And you can make circuits bigger if you want, you can change them. Always remember, it is always active, active connections. So we want that resiliency. So it is not active, passive. I get two connections, active, active. So if I bought, let's just throw out a number. Let's say I bought a one gigabit per second circuit. I actually get two one gigabit per second circuits. So my actual bandwidth if there's no maintenance going on, if there's no fiber cables have failed, if there's no hardware failures or road work cutting through something, I'll actually get two gigabits per second because of the active, active nature of the express route. So when that's active, active for my physical connections, my routing, uh, when we do BGP, which we're about to talk about, and I'm exchanging routes, I'm gonna have redundant BGP sessions as well. That's required to get my SLA. Now again, if I only have one physical wire between my location um, and the service provider that meet me, that's okay. It's obviously not as good as having two physical cables, um, but you're still gonna get two virtual ethernet connections over it. You're still gonna kind of split those things. So 
This is all just connectivity at this point. All I have done is connect my network to the Microsoft backbone. I'm not consuming any service yet. But I now have a connection that I can work with. So let's take it to the next level. Remember I talked about there were different types of services. So we've got that Microsoft backbone as always. And let's just take one region for now. We say this is West US, but it doesn't matter. So I can have a virtual network. Remember that's probably going to be an RFC 1918 IP space. 10.172.16.192.168, whatever. And I can put VMs and scale sets and worker nodes for Kubernetes clusters. I can inject PaaS services in there with a private link. But I have a virtual network where I can have resources. Then there are also services, things like storage and database, and those PaaS offerings that ordinarily just kind of broadcast out to the internet. They advertise the routes so that they operate over a certain IP. Each service has a certain number of IPs it's offering service over. Hey, internet, this is how you get to Azure Storage in West US. Go to these IP addresses. Then of course, remember we have things like Office 365, a SaaS solution, which is not region specific. So like Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, a whole bunch of other stuff. And again, for those regional network gateways, they are kind of connected to that backbone. So there's me, and we have established our express route connection. So we are now connected, yay, to that Microsoft backbone. So now it's how do we consume the services? So we need routing domains, types of service we're going to consume. So we call these peering types. And there were two. There was a third in the past. There used to be something called public peering. Public peering we use to access the PaaS services. Um, you can't get that anymore. If you, if you set this up ages ago, you still have it. It wasn't deleted, but I can't turn it on now on new circuits. So we have two types. We have something called Microsoft peering. I can't spell. There you go, Microsoft Peering. So Microsoft Peering is essentially all of those PaaS services, those SaaS services that don't live within a virtual network, i.e. their public IP space, they're not living within a virtual network. Now, you cannot just turn on Office 365 even with Microsoft Peering. Um, A, you have to have Express Route Premium, but even then, you have to get special authorization to turn it on. Uh, Office was designed to work over the internet. There's very specific scenarios where you should be using Express Route for Office. So you have to work with kind of the Office team to get kind of whitelisted to be able to turn on Office 365 services over Express Route. Even if you buy premium, which is a requirement for the Office, you still have to get authorizations to do that. Microsoft peering, that stuff. Private peering. The virtual network. Things within a private IP space, things within my virtual networks. So I have two types of peering. Now I have to set those up. I have established an express route circuit. So great, I've got my circuit. Remember, I had that service key, which is what the service provider, Microsoft and myself have in common. That's what ties these things together. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between the service key and that's the service key, S key, and the circuit. I now have to turn on the peering. I can turn on Microsoft peering. I can turn on private peering. I can turn on both. It's up to me as the customer which one I want to use. Realize the types of service that are being offered. With Microsoft peering, these are all over public IP space. They are public IPs being broadcast out to the internet. If I want to consume those through Express Route, I now need to kind of offer that service, say, hey, to get to me, you can come this path instead. 
So ordinarily they're broadcasting out to the internet, hey, if you want this storage, come to this address and come this path, come by the internet. So we're gonna now offer those services as well, a route via my express route. So these are public IP space to enable Microsoft peering, we have to set up using public IP spaces. And what you actually need is for the Microsoft peering, on that circuit we've created, we need a slash 29 public IP space you own. Or it can be two slash 30s. It's gonna get broken up into two slash 30s. Now remember a slash 30 is four IPs, but only two of them are usable. Remember the, the first IP is the network, zeros, the last one's kind of that broadcast, I can't use it. So a slash 30 gives me two usable IP addresses. The reason we need two slash 30s is remember, when we establish a connection, we have two active, active paths. So we need a slash 30 public IP space. The first usable IP address, remember this couldn't actually be the same. So I'm doing slash 30, so we've actually, um, that's the, the size of it. The first IP goes to the customer, the second one goes to Microsoft. And then this one, um, again, whatever you're, you're picking here, maybe this is eight and nine, we use one, the customer has one. So you have to provide those from your public IP space. This is for Microsoft peering. So I have to have a public IP space. Over this, we're gonna establish those dual BGP sessions to ex um, share the routes. So that's kind of an important part of this. Now another concept is ASN. So your network has kind of a, an identifier, uh, an autonomous system. So this has an autonomous system number. And here we want that to be publicly registered. So I can think about the um, IANA, uh, kind of that internet authority. Not only do they give out the public IP space, um, they give out those ASNs as well. It used to be a 16-bit number, and now they've moved to a 32-bit number because they ran out. So I have an ASN, because what I want to do is actually tell it, hey look, here's my network. So I'm going to tell it my ASN number, maybe X, whatever it is, I'm going to pass that on. So I have to own that ASN. There is a way to use a private ASN, just like IP spaces. Um, there is a range of ASNs that are reserved for internal use. So essentially, I've got these two slash 30s, which enables me to establish the connection. Again, public IP space must be public. I've got my ASN, which should be publicly registered to me. And the last thing I need is, well, on my network internally, remember these are kind of my edge routers here, on my network, am I using public IP addresses? No. Uh, I'm gonna be doing RFC 1918, again, those 10.172.16.192.168. So I have to nap the traffic. I have to nap the traffic. So on my end, again, I'm gonna have a NAT service or multiple NAT devices. Well, they have to have public IPs as well. So those NAT devices have public IPs, which convert in those internal IPs to stuff that I can actually send out to public IP-based services. So when I set up the Microsoft peering, I have to give it these two slash 30s to set up um, the routing, the BGP peers. I have to give it my ASN. That's actually gonna get verified that I own it. And if I don't own it, there's a process to go through. I also have to give it the prefixes I want to advertise via the connection. So it's a separate range of IPs that I'm using for NAT. So depending on how many NAT devices I have, maybe that's a, I don't know, a slash 29, it could be a slash 30, it, it could be some whatever. It's gonna depend, probably not gonna be that many, you probably don't have that many NAT devices. So that's going to perform the natting of this internal traffic going over the Microsoft peering over to ExpressRoute to those services. 
be it PaaS, Office, whatever that might be. And the great thing here is because I'm doing the NAT, I know the IP addresses that that traffic is going to be coming from to those Azure services. Because I'm doing the NAT, it's my public IP. I know exactly what IPs are doing the NAT. So, if on these services, like a storage account or Azure SQL database, I want to do a firewall and restrict who is allowed to talk to it, if I'm not doing private link or something else, well, I can open it up only if it's coming from the IP addresses of my NAT device. So it's actually a, a nice thing there. And that's the Microsoft peering. Part one. Part two, there's a lot of Microsoft services. Storage and SQL and Cosmos and Office and Azure AD. There's a lot of regions all over the world. I might only want to use via Express route storage in East US and West US or SQL or something else. I don't want the routes being sent to me for every single region on that Microsoft backbone. I don't want all of that to come over my express route. So the other thing we do is we create a route filter. And in that route filter, we kind of tick which services we want to come over the express route connection. If we go and look at the route filter, well, we can see there are entries broken down just by region for storage, for SQL, for Cosmos. There are entries for global services around the office. Again, I have to get that exception if I want to use the office ones. So I create a route filter. I then link it into my peering, my circuit, and then only those associated services will get advertised down to my express route. So it's a way of controlling what routes are offered to me. Anything not within that route filter, I'm not going to get offered a route for. They would still get access via the internet and not via my express route connection. So the route filter is absolutely critical. It won't work until I do the route filter and connect it. That controls what services I'm going to see over my express route. When I create an express route circuit, I create it in a subscription. But it's not limited to that subscription. This is IP routing. We have to create the express route circuit in a subscription for billing purposes. That's it. Once I do this route filter, I'm telling it, hey, for the services that I've selected, I now want you to offer those routes via BGP via the express route connection. So saying, hey, to get to me, come this way. And it's likely going to be a more specific path for a longer specification. So I'm going to go that route, or I can use local preference on my routers to make sure I use that to get to the services that are being offered. But now I'm getting those things. I'm getting those services via here. But it's any instance of that service. So if I've turned this on, for example, for South Central Storage, it's not only storage accounts in my subscription of the circuit. It's any storage in Azure in that region. So if there was another Azure AD tenant, another subscription, and I happen to go and access a storage account because they wanted me to do something, it's going to go over my express route circuit. So you realize this is controlling the routes being offered to me for that service, for whatever is in that scope of that region of that service type. Another thing I should have pointed out, these NAT addresses that I'm using, I'm advertising this way, you cannot offer these to the internet as well. Things will get very bad. Um, I can only offer these to my express route connection. If I advertise those same NAT addresses out to the internet, I can get this asymmetric routing happened. Because it will know, well, well, how should I go to it? So maybe I send the request out that way, and I get the response coming in via my internet connection. I probably have a stateful firewall. A stateful firewall says, I never requested this. It will block it. So you have to be super careful. This range right here that I'm specifying for my NAT, I cannot also advertise to the internet. Super important. Be a very sad day for everybody. So that's really the Microsoft peering. Two slash 30s or 29 to actually establish the BGP, the, the connections in. A separate set of IPs that I'm going to use for my natting. 
I have my ASN that identifies my network. Um, for Microsoft, all these addresses are public IP space. I want to have this publicly registered, the IANA, or maybe there's a regional authority I'm using instead that's kind of a, a sub of that. I've got my route filter. Those services will now be offered my express route, and I'm good to go. Now, I'm going through all of these manual steps. Again, this is getting really nice with the providers. Um, I recently actually did some work with AT&T and NetBond. You don't play with any of this. Uh, you go through the AT&T site. You say, hey, I want to set up this peering. They do the API calls to Azure. They create these uh, BGP. They specify the IPs. They, you can look up, see what they are, but you don't care. It's all just kind of done for me behind the scenes and, and I'm kind of good to go. Okay, so now what about private peering? So remember, for the Microsoft peering, they were public IPs. So when we set up our two links over which we'll also have those BGP sessions, we had to use public IP space. So we had the two slash 30s. Uh, in fact, that's wrong. Um, my math is not very good today. Zero, one, two, three, four. This would have been five and six. There we go. Um, when I do private peering, well, now I'm dealing with probably a private IP space. Again, probably that RFC 1918, the 10.172.16, etc. So I need to do exactly the same thing. For the private peering, we'll do a different color. Once again, I have to have two slash 30 IP ranges, but now they're probably gonna be from a private IP space. They can't be the same IP space that I'm using in an on-prem network or in the virtual networks, but they can be from a private IP space. Could you use a public IP space? Yes, but why waste the IP addresses unless you've just got so many you're throwing them around. So now for the private peering, these two slash 30s will now be from a private IP space. And my, I still have an ASN that can also be uh, private. Now, you can use public, and later on we're gonna talk about if I have multiple connections and influencing routing, in which case it needs to be a public ASN because Microsoft's gonna strip out any ASNs I pass that are private. It won't do anything with them. I don't have to have a NAT IP range this time because I'm actually gonna to go to like a, a, a gateway on the virtual network itself. So here, I want to connect to virtual networks. So let's kind of jump over for a second. So once again, I have my region, and this time I have a VNet. And then once again, kind of I've got my on-premises location. Um, I have my express route set up. I turned on private peering on the circuit. Again, remember the circuit can have both Microsoft and private peering. So I've set up that connection, and essentially what I've done now is connect, once again, my network to that Microsoft backbone. I've said, yes, I could do private peering. I gave it those two IP scopes, I've told it my ASN, so now I have the connectivity. I'm not actually connected to any virtual networks yet. So what we have to do to connect to a virtual network, because it's not public IP space, I can't just route to it. We need something, well, there's really two things. Remember, this virtual network has a certain IP space. It consists of one or more sets of IP CIDR ranges. Probably gonna be from the RFC 1918. So I can't just advertise those generally. So what we have to have is a VNet uh, gateway of type express route. So this goes in its own kind of subnet, and I'm gonna put my gateway. So again, this is going to be an express route. There's different SKUs for the express route gateways, uh, really based on the performance of those. And based on the SKU, I can have ones that are zonal, so they're tied to a particular availability zone. I can have ones that span availability zones, or they can just be regional. So I have different options for the gateway. But I'm going to create an express route gateway in the virtual network. So it goes in its own uh, subnet. I think the minimum size I think you can do a slash 28, check the documentation, but if you also want to do um, 
a site-to-site -site VPN gateway as well on the same virtual network uh, for backup purposes. Uh, the recommendation is a slash 27. So I create a subnet, I deploy my express route gateway. Now, remember I have turned on private peering on my circuit. What I now do is I get an authorization key on that circuit. So I get an authorization key and then I connect the gateway to the circuit using that authorization key. So yes, the express route circuit lives within a certain subscription. But as long as I have kind of the resource ID of the circuit and I have an authorization key that I've generated on the circuit, I can consume that by gateway anywhere. So this could be in a, a different subscription, it could be in a different Azure AD tenant. So someone with permissions on the circuit is going to create me an authorization. And by default on a standard SKU, I can create kind of 10 of those. I can have 10 people connecting into me. 10 different virtual networks. If I go premium, uh, I think it's between 20 and 100. If I go premium, it increases as the, the size of the circuit gets bigger. And again, that's outlined on the Microsoft documentation um, for my express route SKUs. So I get the authorization, and now what's gonna happen is, when I connect that to the circuit, now I've essentially plumbed in through my express route down to what it's connected to, so my on-prem network. So now this IP space is gonna get advertised down to my on-premises routers. Remember, I've got my kind of routers on-premises on the edge. So now this knows about the IP space here. This knows about the IP space from on-premises. They're advertising to each other. So I have connectivity from the things in my VNet to on-prem, things from on-prem into that virtual network. Again, the gateway is facilitating that. And as I mentioned, I can have multiple VNets. I deploy their own gateway, and they can also connect to the same circuit. They could be in different regions. They can connect to the same circuit. Because they're connected to the same circuit, they can actually communicate with each other. But remember, let's say these two virtual networks are in the same data center, same region. Remember, there is still a meet me location. So we still have that meet me. And that's where the routers are that are enabling this connectivity. So even though these two might be kind of next to each other, physically they can wave to each other over the racks of servers. If I want them to talk via the express route circuit, it's actually gonna bounce via the meet me. So if I was based in Dallas and this meet me was in Dallas, let's say this is South Central, so that's San Antonio, when these two talk, if this is the only connectivity they have, the traffic will hairpin to the meet me and back again. So I'm gonna get whatever latency that is. So it's really not that efficient. What I would do, even if I wanted to connect these to the circuit, if I wanted them to be able to talk to each other, I would still add VNet peering. So it's a different type of peering from Express Route, which is the private and the Microsoft. This is VNet peering, allows VNet to talk to each other. So that's kind of a pattern um, that I might use. So yes, I can connect multiple VNets to one circuit. Again, I can have 10 for standard, uh, 20 to 100 if it's premium. Another pattern I might use, let's say I had lots of different VNets over here. I don't want to manage, the gateway I pay for as well, remember, the bigger the gateway, the more I'm gonna pay. I don't wanna put a gateway in every one of these and I have a limited number I can connect. So what I can actually do is I can do peering from the spokes to the hub. I can, on this hub, basically say, look, I'm gonna allow gateway transit. I, you can use my gateway peering connections. On these spokes, I'm gonna say use remote gateway. So use the gateway that I'm connected to. These can't have their own gateway in that VNet. And now they can talk via the gateway in the hub. 
So that's a kind of a very common pattern I'll see. I'll have this hub virtual network that has the connectivity to express route. Then I can have spokes around it that will use its connectivity to actually go and talk. So this gateway is doing two things. It's facilitating, again, because this is a private IP space, it's facilitating the communication into the VNet. Outbound does not go via the gateway. Remember, the outbound flow, um, it, it can actually just bypass. It can go out. There are other IP addresses on here, on the mics that it can go and talk to. So the inbound goes to the gateway. Outbound doesn't go via the gateway. It's also used for that BGP, for that sharing of the routes. Now, it's thing called Express Route FastPath. Now, with FastPath, this has to be the ultra skew gateway, um, the three, uh, the, the top tier one. And then I can turn on FastPath. And what this will actually enable me to do is bypass the gateway for the traffic. So you can think about that gateway supports a certain size, a certain amount of flow through it. When well, imagine I had an express route direct and I had 100 gigabits per second, the gateway maybe goes up to 9 or 10. So I can't get the full amount of bandwidth into my VNet. If I turn on fast path, well now the gateway is not used for the traffic coming into the virtual network. I could get the full 100 gigabits per second into that virtual network. So I think I can turn on if I have the ultra, uh, the ER, GW3, EAZ, whatever it is, the top skew of the gateway. And so I have to have the gateway. Remember the gateway is also doing those BGP exchanges, sharing the routes, so it still has to be there, but the traffic will no longer flow through it. So if I want absolutely the lowest possible latencies, the highest amount of bandwidth, I can bypass the gateway. If I was doing that, I would also turn on accelerated networking on the virtual machines themselves, that bypasses the virtual switch. So I'm doing everything I can to remove anything between the flow of the data. So this is great. We have Express Route, we have the Microsoft, the private peering, we're enabling all this connectivity. We have this one connection. We probably want some resiliency. So let's think about this for a second. Let's, for example, and for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna really focus on, let's just say two regions. So I'm going to have a region here, I'll just say this is West US, I'm going to have a region here, let's say this is East US, I didn't mean to write WUS, uh, what happened. And as an organization, I have a data center in West and a data center in East. And I do have kind of my own backbone network that connects those things. Now, I could just have one express route. So I could have one express route and I've established that connection. Again, there's really multiple connections, but we're not going to focus on that. So it can talk. Remember, these are actually on the Azure Backbone Network. I'm not actually connecting to a certain region. My express route is to the Microsoft Backbone Network. So from this, I could open my backbone network, go up the express route here, talk to West US, or I could go and talk to East US. That's a super inefficient path. So what I would probably do is, so yes, this is the meet me in West US. So I've got a certain meet me in West US. I would also add an express route over here in East US. So now the logical flow of traffic will be, look, if I want to get, if I'm here and I want to get to a service over here, maybe it's a PaaS service, let's just say it's a storage account. There's also storage accounts over here. I would take this path. That's the logical thing to do. And I might only do this connection. So remember with PaaS, we do route filters. The route filters tell me what services to offer over this connection. So I might say on this one, I only advertise West US. On this one, I only advertise East US. But what if this kind of goes down? Wouldn't it be good to be able to take in a worst case scenario um, the, the other express route path? So I actually want to offer both over both of the connections. So my route filter would say, hey, West US and East US, storage and SQL, whatever services I want to use. 
But when I do that, remember what I'm actually advertising are sets of IP addresses. There's a set of IP addresses associated with storage in West US. There's a set of IP addresses associated with storage in East US. And I will just get those routes sent both ways. And I don't actually know which are which. There's going to be so many of these. Now multiply it by other services and other regions. So what I'm going to do is in addition to sending the IP address, they also send something called a BGP community. So this is saying that's sent along with the IPs and there's like a BGP community for West US storage, BGP community for um, West US SQL. So these different community values for the different types of service. And we can actually go and look these up. So here as we look at them, we can see, hey look, yeah, there's regional BGP community for East US. Then there's a different one for storage, for SQL, for Cosmos. And then if we keep kind of scrolling down and looking at the list, we'll see there's other ones available as well for kind of the global services. So things like Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, CRM, etc. So we're being sent those. So along with the routes, so we're being told, hey, in this network, we have these IPs. We're being told actually what it's for via that BGP community, and we can look those up. So even though on my router, I'm going to get both of these sent to me. What I can actually say is, yes, I see that path coming from kind of both of those connections. But I'm going to give a higher local preference on this express route for this BGP community. Because I know this is actually West. So if I want to go to West storage, I'll take this express route. So that's going to have a higher local preference on my routers. So that's how I can kind of influence that routing. So let's figure about kind of those, those PaaS services. And because of the BGP community, I know what region the IP address is I'm being sent actually relate to. Because I absolutely don't want the flow from here to here to go that way. That would be a bad thing. Okay, so now... What about other types of service? What about things like Office 365? What about if they want to try and get to my network? Remember, Office 365 doesn't really live in a region. It's kind of floating out there in Azure. Now, I'm talking about Office 365 here. This is also going to apply to our private peering when I have sets of IP addresses here and here. And I want Azure to know, well, which way should it go if I have redundant connections. Remember we talked about the autonomous system number. It identifies a particular network. And I can think about that autonomous system is some set of networks that have a common operator, they're owned by a common company. And so I'm gonna have an autonomous system number here. And the way BGP works is, well, let's look at a different example. So for a second, let's forget about BGP. Let's just imagine I am um, the park. And in the park, I have a swing set. So there are swings in the park. So that's something within my area of the park, I have certain resource swing. And then there's a, a street that connects me to, um, we call it a Mr. Wimpy. You know, in England, Mr. Wimpy is like the equivalent of McDonald's. So I have a Mr. Wimpy. And I advertise, I say, hey, look, um, the park has swings. And I'm telling it, hey, look. So he now has a list of things. And he says, hey, look, if, if someone wants to get to a swing, I know I'm directly connected. There's a road straight to park. Well, Mr. Wimpy is connected to um, the coffee shop. Here's a direct connection. So he's going to shout out to the coffee shop things he knows about. So remember, he has connections to other facilities and everything else. So he shouts out to the coffee shop, hey, look, you go to Mr. Wimpy, then park to get to a swing. 
So now he knows, hey, if I want to get to the swings, I go to Mr. Wimpy, and from there I can see the park where I'll get the swings. And then the coffee shop, they connect to the pizza shop. And so he advertises, hey, look, um, the route is coffee shop to Mr. Wimpy to park gets you to swings. So if I'm at the pizza shop and I want to get to swings, well, my route table, the place I had to get to places, it says, okay, we'll go to the coffee shop first. Hey, I've got a path to that. I can see it in the street. Then I would go to Mr. Wimpy. For Mr. Wimpy, I can get to the park. I'm kind of going via landmarks. So rather than having addresses, I'm going through these landmarks. So as you can see, the route to get to the swings, I just add my company name, my location to the front. And so then I can kind of work through that to get to that end point. That's all it is. So I took that exact same thing. Maybe I can even draw it on the same idea. Instead of it being Park and Mr. Wimpy and anything else, let's instead pretend we're somewhat professional. And now, instead, these are networks. So this might be a network, I'm going to call this instead of Park, this is network ASN 64500. This is network 64502. This is network 64504. This is network 64506. And these are actually not on the private range, so apologies if I'm using someone's actual real ASN. And instead of this being a swing in here, there's an IP range. There's a certain IP range, I know, 1.10.0.0 slash 16. Probably not very realistic, but whatever. So now the advertisement, so there's peering, there's BGP relationships. They set up BGP sessions between them. So instead of advertising Park Swing, I'm going to advertise, hey, look, Network 64500 has 1.10.0.0 16. Network 64502, when it shares that route, it adds its ASN to the start of it. So it says, oh, 64502, then 64500 gets you to 10.1.0.0. This one adds on its route, its ASN to the start of it. So it adds, oh, okay, 64504, 64502, because that's what was sent to it, 64500, gets me to 10.1.0.0 slash 16. So now its routing table has that line in it. So if something on here, this network, wants to get to 1.10.0.0/16, it knows the path that it needs to take. That's the connected set. And that's Border Gateway Protocol, that's BGP. That's how basically we build up these routes and how we share them. And you can think about it, obviously we have all these different connections, all these different uh, relationships. We'll get these complete route tables built. So that's how the ASN is used in BGP. It's really nothing more than saying, hey, here's stuff I have in my network. I'm telling you about it. And then it tells its connections, its peer, and its peer, and its peer. So they all share, and eventually they all get these complete routing tables. Some of them will be summarized at certain points. Otherwise, we'd have so many routes. So certain carriers will summarize its complete scope within its network. Then when it's hit, it can get more specifics. There are other things happening. That's fundamentally what this is all about. So now we're back to this. Remember, we are using BGP. We are an ASN in our network. We are basically advertising our public IP range, if this is Microsoft peering. Remember, we had that subnet, that our NATS devices. That's how things could actually come back. So if I want to tell Office, look, for this IP range for my NATs here, let's just call this IP space 1 and IP space 2, they have the same ASN. This is one big network. So let's just say my ASN is 400. That's my ASN. So ordinarily, they would both be saying the same thing. They know about both sets of networks. So they would ordinarily send it, well look, 400 network has IP1, 400 network has IP2. And it would be saying exactly the same thing. So 
poor my office has no clue which way to go. It could go either way. So it might actually try and get to IP2. It's got route, seeing it both directions, they're equal, and we'll go this way. Then it has to traverse there. So you'll hear about something called AS path prepending. And if I think back to my directions here, let's just say I'm on a, a street and there's two ways I could go. Um, there's, a, there's a Mr. Wimpy on the corner here and there's a coffee shop on the corner over there, but I'm much, much closer to the Mr. Wimpy. But essentially to get to the park, they can both see it. So they'd look equal. So if I was trying to help someone, I'm a human, I'm kind of lazy. Whichever has the shortest number of hops, I'm going to take. So I could say, hey, you can take McDonald's or Mr. Wimpy, whatever you want to go. For Mr. Wimpy, you're there. It, 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 I can then get to the park. Coffee shop, then go coffee shop, and then you can get to the park. Now, even though I said coffee shop twice, I'm not really listening. I just heard Mr. Wimpy once for one route, and I heard coffee shop, coffee shop, the other route. It's like, well, that's longer. I'm not going to go that way because there's two hops, even though two of them are the same. I'm going to go the Mr. Wimpy route. So I'm influencing what way I'm sending that person by making one path sound longer, even though those two hops are actually to the same network, the same place. I do the same thing here. So prepending is basically saying, look, um, to get to IP2, when I'm sending it this way, I'm actually going to write 400 again at the start of it. I'm making it look longer, so it's less attractive. On the other connection, I'm going to make IP1 look longer. So again, it's less attractive. So when Office sees both these paths, if it wants to get to IP space 1, well, there's one path that this is sending that's got one hop, or this path that has two hops. It's going to take whichever one is the smallest, which means I'm going to go that way. So that is AS path prepending. There's nothing more to it. It's I'm just adding the ASN again at the start to make it look longer. And again, I'm lazy. I'm going to take that one. So that's, that's cool. And that works. That's for Microsoft peering. So remember, we had two different approaches. We kind of thought about the idea of, hey, um, if I want to go to it, I use the BGP community. I use that local preference to say, hey, if, it, if, if it's west, go this way. If it's east, then sure, I can go that way. But I'm never going to go to west by going across my network, up, and then over again. So I'm making this route look more attractive to get to west. If I was going to east, I could still take this route, get on the Azure the fastest. I just definitely don't want to go that way. For things coming back from office this way, um, I can use the path prepending to influence it. What about, so I've got redundant, and the whole point of this is I've got redundant paths. That's key. I'm making this more attractive, but if this one was down for some reason, it still has the second path, so it, it could take the less attractive route. Same for the local preference going that way. Yes, my preference is to go this way to get to here, but if that link was down, it would go that way to get to it. My whole point is resiliency. What about virtual networks? So again, I think about, okay, well, I have a region here. I have a region here. And I keep drawing a single line. I've got a data center here, a data center here. They've got their backbone network. But this could also be an MPLS. If it's an MPLS any to any, I just have those multiple nodes coming off the meet me. A lot of this is just done automatically for me. Once again, I kind of got my express routes. Got two different circuits coming in, in meet me's local to east and west US. Now I've got a VNet in each of them. Now remember, a virtual gateway, I've got the gateway in both. I can connect to multiple express route circuits from a single gateway. So the obvious one I'm going to add is this. Obviously, I want that connection right there. But for resiliency sake, 
I'm also, remember we've got the Microsoft backbone going across there. I'm also gonna go and connect to that one. I've now got kind of redundant paths. I can always go over that network. Essentially, you can think about it as that away. From this gateway, it connects to that one, obviously, and it's also gonna connect to this one. You kind of get this bow tie. So that's my resilient connection. From this gateway, I can go either way, I'm connected to both circuits. But once again, I wanna optimize my routing. If all things were equal, how do I know which way I should be going? This has a certain IP space, and this has a certain IP space. Once again, they're all gonna be getting advertised. I'm seeing it from both of them. So I'm thinking about the VNet going to on-prem first. How do I do that? How do I make this route more attractive to get to here than that one? There's actually two things I can do. I can do it manually. So I'm gonna have these connections on my gateway and I can actually do a weighting on them. And I can actually give a higher weight to the local, the one that I consider local. So I could give this a weight of 150, where that maybe is like 100. Which means this is gonna be more attractive. Likewise, this one will be 150, that would be 100. So in all things being equal, it's gonna rather take this path down to get to the network. But if that was down for some reason, uh, I could take the other path to get to the network as well. So I have another choice. Now the other thing I can do is that that path prepending. So this is me manually assigning weights. That's me saying, hey look, this one is this value, go that way. Totally can do that. But remember, I'm also using BGP to advertise. Again, I've got my ASN of this network. Should have been more clear. This is gonna to have to be a public ASN, this can't be private. This will not work if this is a private ASN because Microsoft's gonna strip out private ASNs when it receives them. So this path prepending won't work if this is a private ASN. It has to be a public ASN registered to you. So that's kind of an important point if you wanna use path prepending. So that's gonna apply here as well. Remember, I can normally, with private peering, just use a, a private um, ASN I need to use a public ASN if I want to do the path prepending for this. So once again, remember, I'm going to be advertising, hey, look, IPX, and I know about IPY on this connection. And again, I'm, let's say I'm ASN 400, I think that's the one I've picked. It doesn't matter. ASN 400 is a valid public one. Well, once again, I can do the prepending. I can say, look, IPX, yep, it's 400. IPY, oh, that's 400, 400. This one, I'll do the opposite. So I'm advertising the routes that way. And so this connection, yes, it's being told about IPX from this route as well, but this has two hops. So when this is trying to decide how to get to on-premises and it wants to get to IPX, it's got one route saying, hey, um, there's a single hop to 400. This way, there's two hops, 400, 400 to get to the IPX. So it's gonna prefer this one. So two options, from the VNet to my on-premises and optimize and make sure it goes the right direction. I can either assign weights to the connection. So the one that's closest, the direct, I'll give it a higher weight, lower one to the other. Or I can use path prepending if I have a public ASN to make the other IP space that's on a different data center have a longer path, so it wouldn't try and come this route by default. If it can go another way, it's gonna go the one with the shortest path. So I can use the path prepending as well. That is from the VNet down to on-premises. What about me taking the right path? I wanna to get to this virtual network. Again, this virtual network has an IP space. Z. Remember, I can't have overlapping IPs anywhere. It's all unique IP space. I want to get to IPZ. I want to make sure I don't go over that express route over here to there, up to there. I want to make sure I take that path. This is where I can do local preference again. Now, there are no BGP communities based on the regions for 
um, private peering. But I do know which IP spaces I use in each region. So on my local router, I would set a higher preference um, to go this way for IP range Z than the other way I could go. So I would use local preference at that point. That's, I think, really the only way I can influence the routing that way. So again, I have to know what IP spaces I'm using in this region, and I would use local preference to say, hey, that, that's a higher preference for me um, to get to that IP space than that path to get to it. I, I never want to end up doing that. If this links down, sure, but the whole point of what we're doing here is to make sure the connection is always that way to that way, that way to that way, and only goes other routes if my local connection is down. It's all about that resiliency. So that, that's really the resiliency part. I guess there's one other thing. Um, we have the express routes. They are connected to the Microsoft backbone. Now you have your own network connecting your data centers together. There is something called express route global reach. So let's kind of simplify this for a second. Um, I have a location, I have a location, they have a backbone network. Um, they are connected to express routes here and here, which are connected to the Microsoft backbone. And then I have different regions of stuff that I, I can get to. So from either link, I, I can get to stuff but what I can't do is get from here to here via here. I have my own link, but unless I do clever stuff with peering and UDRs, I, I can't use Azure to route between them. So there's something um, called Global Reach, Express Route Global Reach. Essentially with Global Reach, uh, I'm connecting them together. So now, over by the Azure network through the express route connections, I could talk to these two if, for example, uh, this link went down. So I can use it as a backup link. I can also maybe use it as my private link. So that's great, that's US. Um, but then I have another data center in a completely different continent. And I have a provider there, but that provider doesn't enable me to connect my two together. But I, I can set up an express route over here, and that express route is part of the Microsoft Global Network. So hey, I'll use Global Reach um, to connect that. So now they can talk to these via the Azure Backbone Network. That's kind of like an extra thing you can do. Um, the Global Reach does use up one of the connections. So remember, I normally I can have like. 10 vnets connected i think this uses up one of them um, for the global reach so that there's a slight impact there but realize um so that is an option so we covered a huge amount of stuff it's obviously a very long video this wasn't going to try and cover this in six minutes um, i hope it was useful microsoft has some great documentation on this um, goes through that again i talked a lot about kind of manual things and setting up ips the two slash 30s, all of this stuff. More and more now, your service provider will do that for you. You go to their portal, they have APIs that hook into this. They're gonna configure a lot of that behind the scenes. You might not ever look at the Azure portal. It, it will go and do everything for you. But it's good to know what's happening. It's good to understand kind of the resiliency options and how I can use like local preference, how I can use that path pre-pending, and how I can use those weightings on the VNet to influence the direction it takes uh, so I can achieve that resiliency. So again, um, hopefully you were comfortable, you had a nice beverage while you were watching this. Um, if it was useful, please like, please subscribe, please share and comment. Um, until the next video, uh, take care.